so much for the cookies and the gift. That was really nice. Thank you. I, I got distracted. Um, no, it's when I saw the cookies that distracted me. Uh, and so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I was going to start off by saying since Kyle asked such a hard question last time, we weren't letting him back in, but he has snuck in. So uh, I can't start with that line. Brother Bobby, you want to come on up? Um, we're, uh, what book are we studying through? We're in Exodus. Exodus, and we are uh, in chapter 10. Uh, I, th- I believe last week we were able to look through uh, a couple of verses. I... I I will tell you, folks, last week's study and what we did last week, to me, was extremely encouraging. That's the type of stuff I really love to see in Bible studies, where questions are thrown out uh, and talked about, and we search the Scripture. And guess what? There's going to be times whenever I, or maybe everyone here, will say, well, we don't really know the answer to that. Let's study it out this next week and come back and answer it. Um, that I think is, well, I think that's part of what our calling to do is to study through the scripture on these tough texts like that. And I was so appreciative of the way, uh, that the study went last week. I, uh, did you have any more thoughts about last week's and how that went and anything else you want to add? Yes. All right. Are you on? No, I'm going to turn this on. I'll everybody out last week. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, awesome. It's about to be. Testing one, two, three. <laughs> blew it out again. Well, that's what I was trying not to do. Sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I do. I think we, I, I just feel good about us. I don't think we finished it up. I'm a little concerned. And let me just ask you, do you think that Pharaoh had free will after God had hardened his heart? And, and let me just go through an ex- something. Some of you may think that, well, maybe his heart was hardened and he didn't have free will. Uh, by, by the way, I love this question that, that Bob has thrown out. Did Pharaoh have a free will? Right. Because it the repeatedly says that God hardened his heart. Right. And so... You know, in uh, James 1, 13 and 14, it says that uh, God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God does not have to create unbelief, nor does he have to create evil. We're pretty good about taking care of that, okay? So, last week we looked at Romans 9, and it talks about God will have compassion on who God will, and he'll have mercy on him. And then uh, there's another verse a little after that, and it says that God will have mercy on who he will, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, I tend to believe that he actually took his mercy and compassion away from uh, Pharaoh. So he still had a free will, but it was based on what Pharaoh's passions and his lust and his things were. And I'm going to tell you, if I can, a little bit about uh, Pharaoh. But first, let me tell you what's going on here. In Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, and I'm going to start with verse 13. Then right. he's, Genesis okay. 15, verse 13. verse 13. This is 430 years prior to the events that are happening now. Okay? 430 years, and it says here, then he said to Abraham, know certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward, they shall come out, or afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. That's where we are. God is bringing this judgment And this is his prophecy here, or telling us what's going to happen, and this is right where we are. Now let me tell you a little bit about Pharaoh. 
And this event changed everything. And that was the feast and the famine. There were seven years of feast, and then there were seven years of famine. And if you remember, Jacob and his family came to Egypt beginning of the fifth year. There were five years left of the famine. What happened during that time? Joseph handled, you know, he was his second in command, essentially. He actually ruled everything. Uh, but we see that, what did Pharaoh get? He got all their money, didn't he? He got all their livestock. He got all their land. And he got the people, and the people were glad of it because they wanted to survive. And then Joseph set up a system to where he would give them seed to plant, and Pharaoh would get 20% of that. Imagine this happening. I don't know that this has ever happened anywhere in any nation at any time, but this changed everything. We have a Pharaoh that owns it all. Doesn't he? You know what? Not only that, does he own it all, he is actually head of everything else that goes on to the point that the people begin to believe that he is a God. They believe he controls the Nile River, the flow of the Nile River. They believe he is responsible for the fertility of the land and the grain they grow. They believe he controls the sun. And these events that are happening and these ten plagues that we're seeing are based on what Pharaoh had done and the gods that they were worshiping. These are not one day he wakes up, God wakes up and says, hey, I'm going to put lice on them today. Right. You know, that didn't happen. It was a purpose for it. And each one of these events is God is showing him who is in control. Now, remember, two guys show up at Pharaoh's door and says, let our people go. And Pharaoh says, who are you and who is your God? You know, here he is, he's had everything. And this has gone on for 210 years. If you remember, it's 215 years from the time they went into Egypt to the Exodus. And for five years of that, we have the feast where he takes everything. So now we know that for 210 years, this has gone on in Egypt. So what do you expect of Pharaoh? <laughs> Does he have a big ego? Absolutely. And then some two guys show up. Maybe elderly guys. I can say that. Can I? <laughs> says, you can't do this. We're going to take those people. He says, what? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> because he had had them. In fact, he put them into slavery, didn't he? And if he's God of the now, what does the first thing that God does turns it to blood. The frogs, they actually thought frogs were sacred. The lice came along. And you know what the lice did and the flies? Infested their sacrifices and they couldn't sacrifice anymore because they were infected. And we know that and we're getting ready to get into this, the darkness, so I'm kind of jumping ahead. The darkness, who controlled the sun? Well, it wasn't Pharaoh. And what about, we're going to see here, the death of the firstborn. And this is male, by the way. Firstborn, male, born, okay? Do you remember what happened that Pharaoh did? Remember Moses when he was born? What was going on? Killing them. He told his people to throw them in the Nile. In the Nile. So is, is Pharaoh evil? Yes. And God has turned him over into a debased mind like he did in Romans. So he does this on his own. His heart, you know, God has withdrawn from any compassion or uh, 
any mercy for them. Let me tell you a little story. This happened to me. I'm not really proud of it, but I'm going to tell you the same thing happened to me in my own way, my own heart. Was uh, My oldest brother and his wife and Ruth and I were eating breakfast one morning in Fedville, and this waitress came out, and she was... Uh, older than most of the other waitresses. And I real, had a real compassion for her. My mother had to go to work when Carol and I were real small, and she was a waitress we, with six kids at home, and my dad was sick, and we had no income whatsoever. And uh, I always felt for her. She saved her dimes. She might, we, first thing we'd ask, we'd get home. Well, Mom, how many tips she you get today? And it was usually less than a dollar. I remember once she... Ended up with $3 for the day, and she'd save her dimes to buy uh, Christmas. That's what she bought Christmas. So I have a real compassion for that. So I tipped this lady a little more than average, but the service was terrible. You know, they get my, getting our order in, then it came out wrong, and it was just going through that. So I went to the... Uh, cash register after this to pay for it and there's a family in front of me and she was real rude to that couple in front of me just real for no reason real rude my compassion was gone <laughs> do you know what crazy Bob did he went back to that table his heart done got hard and he got that tip isn't that terrible but I did that but I went through that I had compassion for her but when she was so rude to those people. My heart became hard. And I do believe that Pharaoh had a free will, but his heart was so. And as he's going through these events, and we see that closer to, there to the end, he would change his mind. You know, while he was in, under pressure and so on, and a plague was going on, He'd say, I'm going to let you go. And then when he'd get some relief and so on, he'd change his mind. He says, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, uh, so he went through that. And let me tell you a little bit of, about Egypt after that, which we don't see in the scripture, actually, but through the history of that. From that time, when we know their army, part of the army was destroyed and drowned in the Red Sea and so on. And everything, as we would see in chapter 10, if I didn't get ahead of you, Brother Josh, is destroyed. It's dead. What is gone? Money doesn't make much difference now, does it? His land is just destroyed. His cattle and his people have suffered a lot, and many of them have died. That is God's judgment on it. And for the next hundred years after that, it was called the Dark Ages for Egypt. Hmm. They were ransacked. They were seized. You know, they became very, a very weak nation, and many, like the Syrians, came in and took part of what they had left and so on. So God brought his judgment on that because of the things that happened there. So I guess my Leti, God does not do evil to serve his purpose. He does not set it up. It's something that we have in our heart that we do, and we get in a situation, and he does have compassion and Mercy for each of, us, each of us right now. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have any of us be here. He didn't wipe us out a long time ago. Even unbelievers. I mean, we, we could try to... But so, I guess uh, that's my... You know, and, and it's, I think it's important that we talk through and, and kind of think through this. Because uh, one of the teaching of Calvinism, which, which y'all know my stance, my thought on Calvinism. And if you say that people don't have a... Uh, the ability to choose, uh, then you're falling into the trap and the teachings of Calvinism. Uh, and people will say, well, the Pharaoh didn't have a choice. Yeah, the Pharaoh did have a choice. Uh, and the same thing with Judas. Somebody say, well, did Judas have a choice? Yeah, but Judas was turned over to his heart. Uh, to his heart's desire for the money that he thought he was going to collect. And he had justified in his own mind why he, it was okay what he was doing. And so, uh, Bob, thanks for, for taking time to kind of walk through the importance of Pharaoh having this choice. Uh, it's all, it's, it's, it, I think it's important that we do, as students of God's Word, understand 
that Pharaoh did have a choice, just like every lost soul has a choice to surrender their life to Christ uh, or not. They are making that choice. Uh, yeah, and God do draws us to him. He does. If he absolutely didn't draw does. us, we wouldn't have a chance. No to doubt. No, no. There, there, there is a drawing that uh-huh. the Lord has. Uh-huh. Um, Wayne pointed out a scripture uh, to me just a little bit ago that I think would be good. I, I, Wayne, I want you to read it out of your text, though. It's in Nehemiah chapter, um, chapter 9. And so flip over to Nehemiah chapter 9 uh, real quick because I love the way that it was worded, specifically uh, in the translation that Wayne was reading uh, just a little bit ago to me. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse uh, 10 uh, and so, if you will, uh, Wayne, read, read this, uh, this passage and what it says here, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Well, first of all, the, the children of Israel are back in Jerusalem, and they're worshiping, and that's what they're doing. They're recounting all the great things that God has done, and this is one of the things that God has done. Then thou didst perform signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants and all the people of his land. For thou didst know that they acted arrogantly toward them, and didst make a name for thyself as it is this day. And I say that because it uses that word arrogantly. Uh, And as Bob was talking about who Pharaoh was, he was a very arrogant uh, man that that we have seen act this way. Yeah, because he controlled everything. He didn't have to answer to anybody to for no all one. that time there. So, you know, when these two guys show up and tell you you're going to do something that you <laughs> have for a year, you go, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. So, I mean, just think know. if somebody showed up at your house and told you, hey, you're going to start doing these things this way. No, you're not going to tell me what to do. I mean, that's pretty simple, right? Well, think if you were, if everyone looked at you as a God. Uh, all right. Thank you. Any questions uh, for about that that conversation? Kyle, thanks again for bringing that up last week. I sincerely appreciate it. I cut you. Yeah, he was like, "Uh oh, I'm getting called out." Well, You're that really is, not. That is one most people really don't understand. That, it's an easy one to fall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, let's get uh, back to ch- uh, Exodus chapter. Uh, 10, and uh, let's pick up the, the study where we were last week. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2, just to kind of set the stage of what's going on. Seth, you got her gray? All right, they're ready. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. And and so God is saying, hey, I, I'm going to, they, you, but them are going to know that he is God. Uh, and so he's sending them back to Pharaoh. Um, but this time he says that you may know that I am Lord. Remember earlier he had said that Pharaoh would know. And now he's saying to Moses and to the Hebrew children, you will know that I am Lord. Uh, which I thought was a, kind of a difference there. Yeah, so everybody involved in this... It's, it's a, a witness to the Israelites, a witness to the nation of Egypt, and it's God's judgment that he prophesied 430 years ago. I, and I love that Bob pointed that out. This, yeah, this was prophesied 430 years prior to this, that this would happen. Um, and how quickly it seems to have taken place uh, in, front of the, in front of the Pharaoh here. Now let's read verses 3 through 6. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourselves before me? Let my people go, that you may serve me, or else if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. 
and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses, the houses of all your servants, which neither your fathers nor your father's father have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Did y'all notice anything different this time whenever he went into Pharaoh? Anybody notice anything different? Huh? Well, I think that's a great point. He wasn't near as timid this time as what he, he has been when he first started this. But something else? Val? You're kind of raising your hand? Did Moses speak here? Um, I don't know that I know the answer to that, but that wasn't what I was thinking about. It just says, and Moses and Aaron came and said to him, so I don't know if Moses or Aaron, I would assume that Aaron was still speaking. Um, but that wasn't what I was pointing out. Huh? That says that they're repeating, they're saying. Here's what I, Ron, go ahead. He definitely calls out Pharaoh's pride. In fact, he goes right in line with what Wayne just read about the arrogance. He, did you see uh, what he says right there? Uh, in the, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Uh, and, and I think that's sometimes the way that lost people are, are as well. How long will it be before you actually humble yourself as a lost person to come to a surrendering your life to Jesus Christ? Uh, Pharaoh wasn't there. And that's where a lot of lost people are. What I thought, but what I was trying to get to is normally God would tell, and you would see in the scripture, God said, hey, uh, you send flies, you're going to send lice, you're going to do this. This time you don't have that recording. They just come in and say, this is what's going to happen. But it still came from the Lord. I just don't, we just don't see it that he actually tells them that it's going to be locusts uh, that are going to come uh, upon them this time. Uh, but Ron, I think you're absolutely right that he, he calls out the Pharaoh right there for uh, not being humble. <clears throat> um, locust. Who knows what a locust is? What is it, Shubab? It's a big flying bug that makes a loud noise. Big flying bug that makes a loud noise. And eats a lot. Unless it gets around John the Baptist, then he eats it. Do you see that Africa is having that plague now? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I threw that out one day, but you ought to look at what's going on in Africa. Uh, there's a big locusts. swarm of locusts, yeah. a plague-like swarm Thousands of locusts. Thousands of acres have been eaten. I think Zambia is one of them. That was one of the countries I saw. Um, and look at where it says these uh, locusts are going to be. Where is the locust going to be? That's, all you, that's the easiest way to sum it up. Everywhere. In the servant's house, uh, everywhere you go, there's going to be locusts. Now, it also indicates that it was relatively close to when the hell happened. Why does it indicate that it was close to the time that the hell happened? Said, hey, you already lost, you already lost most everything to the hell. But anything that's remaining, in other words, there had not been time for, for the growth of new stuff to come. And so remember that day I asked you, how long does this take? There's an indication of it, this, these two were relatively close together. Right. We don't know exactly how long, but there hadn't been full growth uh, come back since yeah, they the were hill. were residue of what was left over. Yeah. So you can see all of this being destroyed, and it's continually to increase the destruction of it to we'll find that the land is dead. <laughs> it, it is completely destroyed. Uh, and it happens right here. I, I'll just throw this out. I had a guy actually ask me today. Um, they're talking about everything that's going on inside our nation. This person was talking to me about it. Uh, and he said something about, I just don't think that everything could come crashing down that quickly. How could, how could really everything fall that fast? Uh, and then I come here tonight, and when I was, as you were talking, I was like, man, that went awful fast. Yep. It fell yep. really fast. 
Um, and, and I think that if God decides to judge a nation, I don't know why it wouldn't happen yeah. quickly. In, in Joel, it talks about God destroying a nation and the, the Israelites. And he tells them in uh, Joel 2.25, is which is one of my favorite verses I like to pass on to people that are going through tough time. He says, now he's been talking about spiritual, but he says in this, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. The mm. swarming locusts, the crawling locusts, and he just named several of them. So there are different types I get, but he said, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Amen. Um, that's a good verse. Uh, Joel 2.25. Oh. In one hour, yep. Uh, so, I, so I actually think it's pretty arrogant for people in the United States to think that something can happen to uh, our nation really quickly. I think it's very arrogant. It looks like it has a, we're there. We've accepted everything that's been said and we've done, we've stayed home. We've... Yeah, it, yeah. I, I agree. Pretty uh, submissive, huh? Yeah. Brother Jonathan? In a week. Boop. Just shut it down. But, uh, but I, I'm, I really think that, uh, well, there could be lot more, lots more to come. Uh, Unbelievers just don't realize how dependent we are on God. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and I mean, hail can come clear across the country and wipe out every fruit tree. You know, Absolutely. Because they don't trust in God, they don't Yeah. In God. And and they and they wouldn't even acknowledge God if that happened. Yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah. Back, and that's so different from back at the founding of our uh, country, even. And Shubab, you've shared some of these stories with me about. Uh, calling on a day of prayer for rain because there was a drought. Uh, and that's what our uh, founders used to do. Completely opposite of what you're talking about. All right, they're everywhere. Now let's look at verse number 7. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? Folks, I love verse 7. Verse 7 is an amazing verse. And here's the reason why. Do you remember when this all started? When Pharaoh went to, uh, I mean, whenever Moses went to Pharaoh the first time, what happened? You remember Moses went to Pharaoh, said, let my people go. Huh? He didn't let them go, but what happened? They got more work put on them. Remember, they had more work put on them. And so uh, they had more work. And what, how did the children of uh, the Hebrew children, the children of Israel, what did, uh, how did they respond to Moses? They turned on him too, right? And now it looks like everybody's turning on Pharaoh. Look, look at what it says right there. I mean, he's still Pharaoh, but he says, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let them go that they may save the Lord. Do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? That almost sounds like the people are starting to turn on Pharaoh after they've experienced this. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but they... It, yeah, I'm sure it is. Verse number seven you indicates... You them to because... Look tired, at all they've gone through. They're tired of this. They're like, come you on, know, man. Let's get the locusts and just move on. <laughs> that's right. That's, and, that's what he's saying. They're like... Have they you not noticed? They figured it out, hadn't they? After a couple of times, a few times. Seven times they've t said something and seven times it came true. When are you going to get it through your head? Um, all right, verses 10 and 11. Let's see how. Now Pharaoh uh, has this information from his servants. Let's see how Moses, I mean, how he responds. Verses 8 and 9. I mean, uh, yeah, 8, through, 8 and 9. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds we will go, for we must hold, it, hold a feast to the Lord. Uh, 
Pharaoh makes a good choice. Have you ever seen anybody ever make a good choice part way? They don't actually surrender their life to Christ. They go through the motions of surrendering their life to Christ or doing what God has called them to do. That's what Pharaoh's just done. Or you're going to see that's what Pharaoh has just done. He says, yeah, go serve. And then he asks the question, who was going to go? And what was Moses' answer? Everyone's going. We're going to take our, the women are going, the children are going, the cows are going, everything. We're all going. Yeah. Then his response. Let's look at his response at what he says. Verses uh, uh, 10 and 11, no, 12 and through 15. Then he said to them, start with 10. Uh, Yes, that is. It's 10 and 11. Just do 10 and 11. Then he said to them, the Lord had better be with you. When I let you and your little ones go, beware, for evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh turned over to his own heart. And he says, all right, I'll let you go, but who's going? They said, everybody's going. And he says, you better hope your God's with you, because if you you take everybody, I'm coming after you. Evil's coming. Evil is coming, and we're going to get you. And he says, I'll tell you what, Pharaoh's going to make a deal with him. Tell you what, just let the men go. Now, why would Pharaoh say, just let the men go? Because he knows they'll come back. Yeah. It's exactly right. Knows they'll come back for their family. In other words, what's he doing? He's holding a hostage. I'm going to hold a hostage here. That's not what God had said. Uh, Let's read 12 through 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt. Oh, by the way, real quick, just notice also that Pharaoh was driven away. I mean, uh, Moses was driven away from the Pharaoh this time. Remember, we just saw him turn around and walk out. And now this time he's ran out. Uh, and so there is a difference that has taken place there between Pharaoh and Moses. Uh, and then, so as soon as he's ran out, it's like he's chased off, and, and now God says, all right, now let's do this. Okay, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locust, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them, for they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. They had gone through some gross stuff, but this one's pretty bad. Can you imagine every step you took as you walked, you'd be stepping on locusts? Howard? One hundred and thirty million locusts per square mile. Uh, that's a lot of locusts. Every step you took, from the time you got out of your bed to anything you did through the day, you were literally walking on locusts. And they probably were in your bed too. Yes, <laughs> they were probably in their bed too. <laughs> what do you do? In your hair. And by the way, don't forget what Bob said. What? What did you? How did you describe a uh, a locust? They're loud. Yeah. And so there's this whole noise that's going on uh, with, with it. Ugh. I just had a flashback of, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it was, uh, never mind. Um. <laughs> So, so one time, Candy and I thought that we, Tell us, Candy. 
we, we, yeah, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, okay. it's really not that bad a story. I mean, it, it, I hope it's not. Uh, some of y'all might look at me differently. I might be. We'll find out. Hey, I got Can't... the lady's tip. Why don't you <laughs> Uh, there was one time Candy and I uh, took a trip. We decided that we we had never seen Las Vegas. I said, let's go to Las Vegas. And so we go to Las Vegas. And it was one of the worst trips we ever had. We said we never wanted to go back. But um, I got so sick of the noise of that. Ching, 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 ching. That's all you heard the entire time was just gambling machines. Everywhere I went, ching, 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 ching. You shouldn't and, have been playing. <laughs> I wasn't. I'm not, I'm not any. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> but that noise was just, I remember telling Candy, I was just like, I'm just so sick of hearing that noise. Um, and I can't imagine what this would have been like. Anyway, I got very distracted there. Um, so he calls them down. Notice how, now, notice how the, the uh, locusts get there. How do the locusts come? There's an east wind that comes. And somebody said, did, did God already have these locusts in another location and just brought them from that other location? Maybe. He didn't need to. But he chose to use a wind to bring them in. Because he is God. Um, let's read 16 and 17. Then Moses called... Oh, by the way, could you imagine... Sorry, I forgot about this. I'm sorry, I, I forgot about this. Can you imagine if you were one of those servants? Let's just say that, I, that Bob was Pharaoh and I was a servant. I was like, Pharaoh, can you not get rid of this guy? He's been a snare to us. Would you just let, him, let them go and let them do their thing? And then I turn around and leave and he says, all right, go call Pharaoh. I mean, go call Moses. And, and so you think that Pharaoh's going to listen to you and you go home and you tell your wife and your kids, oh, finally, Pharaoh listened to me and there was going to be these locusts, but now they're not coming. He's, he's going to talk it and they're going to work it out. And you go to bed and then wake up the next morning. Can you imagine? They never were. The, the, what would have been going on with the servants, the frustration <coughs> that they're experiencing. I'm sorry, go ahead. 16 and 17. You sure? Yes. <laughs> then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. Pharaoh admits that he sinned, right? A sinner turned to God. Is that what he did? What do you think, Bob? No, that's what he didn't do. He did have, this, this is where the free will shows up. He did have a sense that things weren't right. And, you know, he, he says, I have sinned against God, but he gets over it pretty quick. He gets over it really quick. In fact, notice the words that are used. What does he say? Forgive my sin only this once. Only this once. Didn't care about any of his other sin. Only this once. Brother Doug? Ah, I love that. Did you hear what uh, Brother Doug said? There's a difference between admittance and repentance. And he's admitting uh, that he had committed a sin, not repenting uh, from a sin. Uh, great point there, brother. Uh, so he calls on Moses and says, and by the way, notice the, in verse number 16, he says, and he called on Moses uh, and Aaron in haste. He's like, Get them back in here. He had just ran them out of the house. And now he says, run them back over here. Uh, he wanted them like now. And he says, I have sinned. Let's uh, go ahead and read 18, and, uh, 18 through 20. And, and notice oh, wait, right go at ahead. the end of that it says, uh, that he may take me away from me this death only. Take away from me this death only. 
just so, this. So, you know, in other words, everything is destroyed. Everything is gone, and it's got like a death to him. His oh. nation has, has died. Died, died. Yeah, and it's only going to get worse. 18 through 20. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. What brought in the locust? East wind. What got rid of locust? West wind. And sometimes whenever you study God's word, there's things that there's a, uh, uh, God just shows off. He just kind of, yeah, there's, there's phrases and things where you just say, wow, only God. In fact, there's a new uh, contemporary Christian song. Uh, Jonathan, Seth, I can't, it's about be who you are. Do, do, it, it's saying, God, just do what you do, being God. And when it says that not one locust remained, not one, folks, can you imagine, you had got up that morning and you were walking on locusts every step you took. And then all of a sudden the wind came and there literally was not another one left in the land. That's God just saying, this really is me. It really is. Hey, what's going on in the land of Goshen right now? Life is good. I mean, they're still slaves. They're still working hard. But they still have all their food, all their land, all their crops. I mean, Goshen was a nice area. Yeah, it was the best of the land. The best of the land. So where the Hebrew children are, they've been protected through all this stuff that has just gone on. Why did that happen? God was just showing off that he is God. Protecting his children, too. Uh, which I think is a message to us. Let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's try to make it. Oh, it's 734. Let's, let's make it through uh, this chapter. I might say that this here particular plague, the ninth plague was unannounced. No warning. No warning on this. Yeah. Absolutely. Three, In fact, six and nine had no warning. Uh, this one was, uh, yes, absolutely. As we read this, let's just read the whole thing that happens here. Um, well, let me break it down. Uh, because it's, uh, it really, unannounced. Let's read verses 21 through 23. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. <laughs> Just love that. I love that last phrase. Hey, notice how many times that it took Moses stretching out his hand. Stretching out his hand. I think there's something really powerful. Didn't use the rod this time. Yeah. Yeah, normally it is the, the rod. But you're right. This one was unannounced in its darkness. And how did it describe the darkness? It could be felt. felt yeah. Folks, that's a, that's a deep darkness. There was one time I was in a cave uh, in Harrison, I think. Or maybe, I, don't, I think it was in Harrison. Marble cave. Okay. Uh, and you get down to the bottom and they're saying, hey, we're going to show you what true darkness is. And they turn the lights off. And when they do, they say, now try to touch your nose. The, the difficulty of even being able to touch your nose when you're in a severe dark area is what these people are experiencing. You poke yourself in the eye. <laughs> so you don't know you missed. Yeah, close your eyes when you try that. <laughs> Keep reading. Let's read uh, verse 24. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord only. Let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. Isn't it interesting that Moses didn't even go tell Pharaoh that this was going to happen, but yet as soon as it happened, now Pharaoh knows to go call Moses. And he says, go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. In other words, uh, oh, and your little ones uh, will go with you. In other words, he says, hey, we're just going to keep your animals and, and you go. 
So he's getting closer. Let's read what happens in verses 25 and 26. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we may, must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know what, with what we may serve the Lord until we arrive there. <laughs> Moses is saying, hey, we're stepping out on faith too. Yeah, we see Moses can speak, can he? You see him more and more as we've gone through this. Moses is, is more He is involved, speaking right? more, absolutely. Uh, and... He says, hey, we've got to take our animals. Every, every animal has to come with us. And how does uh, the Pharaoh respond? Verses 27 through 29. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take heed to yourself and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. Hmm. We'll probably come back and talk more about those last two verses right there. Um, but this darkness lasted for three days. A three days darkness that you could feel. Um, yeah, you remember I made the statement that Pharaoh was, people thought he was the god of the sun. Yeah, right. <laughs> Pharaoh, yeah, they thought he was the god of the sun. Okay. And the ninth plague is darkness that he could not overcome. But folks, that statement that Pharaoh makes to him, get away from me, take heed to yourself, and see my face no more. For the day you see my face, you shall die. Still sounds like somebody who's got a pretty hard heart. But I love Moses' answer. And Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. I love that last line right there. You have spoken well. You will never see my face again. All right. We've made it through nine plagues. We're going to look at the tenth one probably uh, next week. But it will take more than one lesson, I think, to get through the tenth plague. I'm just guessing. Um, probably so. Um, Please be here for chapter 11 and 12. I, there's a lot of wonderful information here for this time, but I, not only that, but it applies to other times, and I'll try to show you, show you that too concerning the Passover. Amen. Uh, setting up and the, the Passover and everything that goes with it, I, I, I would highly encourage you to come. Uh, invite your friends. It'd be nice to be able to have the Seder dinner. Oh, that would be. That would be real nice. Sipping a range, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions or thoughts? God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, Lord God, we come before your holy throne. Just thankful for this day, this time that we can come and study your word. Father, we, as we study what happened, you are still that same God. The God that could call it, cause locusts to come by the blowing of a wind. But yet, get rid of it by that same wind. And Father, in a God that could have darkness so thick, yet in the next valley, it's bright light. Father, you are an amazing God. And Father, the, the winds and the rain and the hell... Everything that exists is obedient to your command. Father, I ask that, that we as your children would be just as obedient to your word. That, Father, that we, would, that we, Father, would obey your voice in that same way. Father, I ask that you will guide us in, in these studies, draw us closer in a, uh, to develop a better understanding of who you are. But, Father, also that you would use this teaching time to grow us to be students of your word. Oh, Father, as you'll guide this church, lead us, Father, uh, into all truth by your spirit. And we ask this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.